Hey, One Church CEO, I'm so happy to invite uh, two special guests, Tim Day and his son, Nathan Day, uh, to talk all things Gen Z. Welcome to One Church CEO, guys. Hey, it's great to be with you guys. Hi, thank you. Uh, listen, let's start right off out of the gate by asking you, what makes Gen Z so different? What, what, what makes them different from other generations? What should we know about this new emerging generation? Uh, right out of the gate, they're the first generation that is uh, been globally connected in real time their whole lives. So they get they get called um, digital natives. It's just natural for them to be connected, to be learning, to understand, to to collaborate, to interact all the time. Yeah. So uh, millennials might have the time where I remember back before the smartphone and kind of wishing for simpler times. For Gen Z, they have been living in an interconnected world, which explains a lot of their like, why are they anxious? Yeah. Well, because if I was globally connected all the time, I would be worried about all the issues going on in the world. If I was hyper knowledgeable, like if I was connected, I'd be hyper knowledgeable about everything and uh, I'd want to find practical solutions. So a lot of the things around this generation that defines them is the fact that they've been globally connected in real time their whole lives. Yeah. And maybe just to add to that a little bit, um, I think that that constant um, connectivity and that um, being very, very globally aware, um, it's also creating a very collaborative environment, I think. And you're seeing that in um, like sometimes call them like the TikTok generation, too. I'm not on TikTok, but um, that's a super collaborative app. Right. And so like people are sharing content constantly and adding to each other's content. And I think we're seeing that reflected now at the, the franchise level of a lot of media companies and, and um, story worlds that it's like, Hey, there's an expectation of um, like the term I love is like participatory culture. And it's like, we're expecting participation. We're expecting a feedback loop, right? It's not, this isn't a top down, game so much anymore. So what are some of the things that researchers are seeing and you guys have experienced in some of your work and research about the interests of uh, Gen Z and, and, and their interest in participating? And I'm thinking whether it's in the entertainment area or whether it's in just uh, uh, the world and the, the you, you had mentioned, uh, Tim, about their connectedness and the issues that are going on in the world. And then eventually we'll kind of move that into even spiritual communities. Could you talk a little bit to their interests and their practices? Um, yeah, they, they, because they're globally connected, you see a lot in um, East meets West. Uh, they share across and enjoy things from all across the world. And so you see this rise in, let's say, in kids in the West. They're connected to anime, to uh, K-pop. They are very action-oriented. Yeah. Um, they want their creatives that a lot of them are content creators. They're very natural at generating their own content and sharing that and passing that around. In some ways, they're better content creators than professional content creators. Yeah, and I think um, I think that interest, um, like groups being defined more by terms of interest rather than something like uh, geography or um, like in terms of like I'm I'm more similar and I have more community with the people that I have similar interests with online than maybe I do with the people at my high school, right? Right. And um, yeah, I think it's just, especially in, I mean, our context being Canada and the US, it's like, we're just becoming so much more diverse, like friend groups are becoming more diverse. And, um, and failures on that front are more on display now, right? Like last year with the Black Lives Matter movement and some of the police brutality that was coming to light, it's like, Hey, that's a super important thing. And like, we all have a spot, we all have a place. And, um, I think you've kind of mentioned before, it's like any, anybody's pain is, is shared pain, right? Like we're, we're becoming a big family here. So, so that's interesting, Nathan, because that kind of does speak to the idea of, you know, family, right? <laughs> it really does. You know, uh, how does this play out in church communities? And I'm thinking of spiritual communities where you have Grampy, the parents, brothers and sisters, older brothers and sisters, and yourself at the table. W what do you think the church is going to look like in the hands of Gen Z, for, for example? And maybe speaking to boomers, Xers, even millennials, uh, what should they be anticipating uh, if we're going to journey and have Gen Z as a part of our community, a thriving part and growing into it? 
How, how, where are you seeing that uh, some best practices maybe of making space and room for this generation? You know, a few things. One is action, you know, actions speak louder than words. Uh, this is a generation that wants to take action. Mm. So if you're uh, one of the older generations and you uh, want to kind of be passive and sit back and mail in a check, that's not Gen Z. Gen Z wants to get out and do stuff and be proactive. They want to be a part of global solutions and local solutions, and they want to, you know, help create a better future and be active in that. So uh, they also want to do it together where yeah. everyone belongs and everyone is valued. And you think of those, those, those types of the, just those two ideas. Uh, one more I'll add in grit. They're the first generation since World War II that has grit in their psychological makeup, uh, which means that they may be anxious, they may be struggling, but they're going to try to face their fears. They're going to try to overcome their challenges. They're going to dig in. And if you put those pieces together, it sounds a lot like Jesus, doesn't it? Oh. You know, right? Take up your cross and follow me. Sounds right. pretty pretty. Um uh, you know, the no Jew, no Gentile, no slave, no free, no male, no female. Everyone is one in Christ. That sounds a lot like the Apostle Paul, doesn't it? Where everyone belongs. So a lot of these um, values that they hold are actually, you can find a very deep connection to Jesus' message underneath it. The thing is they want to see it lived. They, they want to challenge the church to really not just aspire to it, but to apply it to their lives and to create a safe community where we do this together. Yeah. And I think um, like what you mentioned, Jonathan, about like how churches are a place where you have people from the older generation, people who are parents, people who are, you know, like children. It's, I think that's one of the really, really strong qualities of Christian communities in general is that value. So just picking up on that, Nathan, and this is for either of you, it's it's almost like throwing uh, throwing them the keys to the car, maybe before we ever received the keys to the car uh, and our generation. And so, uh, you know, speak to, uh, obviously churches have a lot, we have a lot of tradition, we have our ways and stuff. How, how are Gen Z going to operate in that? Uh, you know, if, if you could fast forward the button, uh, and as well, like as we toss them the keys too, what, what, what do you think uh, is going to be some of the long-term fruit in that? When I was younger, you know, Jonathan, I always imagined what I would change in the church when I was, and when I, my generation got older, we'd made those changes. I grew up in a church that had a, an organ and, you know, all those changes happened under us. And I think we should anticipate Gen Z will do the same thing. Uh, when, as they come in, they'll make changes to, rewire the church to reach their generation, their world. Right. They're not building a church for, they're not going to be inspired by God's spirit to build a church for 1950. They're going to be inspired to build a church for 2050, right? Yeah. So it's going to be a different kind of church with a different kind of mission. So we should anticipate that. And so, you know, in terms of some of those traditions, uh, the, every challenge, every generation has to be challenged with Jesus teaching about the wineskins, about pouring new wine into new wineskins, right? And so you have to kind of open up to say some of these transitions may be maintained, some may be re reworked, and some may be let go. That's okay. What's important isn't our traditions. What's important is lives being changed mm -hmm. and people encountering Jesus 